Shalom, and welcome to another edition of The Truth Shall Make You Free. I'm your host, Elder Nathaniel, and on my right, Deacon Asaph. Today's topic, we're going to deal with the beginning of time, the middle of time, and the end of time. But before we get to that topic, let's go to John chapter 8 and verse 32. John chapter 8, verse 32. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So black man, black woman, Latin man and Latin woman, if you want to be set free, you must acknowledge the truth that you are the Israelites, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Repent of your sins as Israelites and accept the one true king, one true savior, Jesus the Christ. Okay, so with that, let's go to Second Esdras chapter 14 in the Apocrypha. Now, we always discuss the Apocrypha. It was originally in the King James Version 1611 Bible. It was there. Do your research. Look it up. But the Protestant whites, Protestant white Christians removed the Apocrypha from the King James Bible in the 1700s. So now, let's go to 2 Ezra chapter 14. We're going to read verse 1 through 6. That's it. 2 Ezra chapter 14, verse 1. And it came to pass upon the third day, I sat on an oak. And behold, there came a voice out of a bush over against me, and said, Ezra's, Ezra's. And I said, Here am I, Lord. And I stood upon my feet. Then said he unto me, In the bush I did manifestly reveal myself unto Moses. So now, the Lord is talking to the prophet Ezra. This is the same Ezra, E-Z-R-A, that you read about in the regular Bible. So, he manifestly uh, revealed myself unto Moses. Revealed himself unto the prophet Moses. Listen good. Go ahead. And talked with him when my people served in Egypt. And I sent him and led my people out of Egypt and brought him up to the Mount of Sinai where I held them by me a long season. How long was that long season? Forty days and forty nights. No unlearned Christian. Moses was not forty days and forty nights getting just Ten Commandments. He was up there getting the history from Genesis to the book of Deuteronomy. Those first five books, that's Moses was getting all the history given to him all over again. And he was writing, and he was writing, and he was writing. That's the long season of 40 days and 40 nights. Read on. And told him many wondrous things. Uh-oh, here we come. And showed him secrets of the time. Uh-oh, and showed Moses secrets of the times. Go ahead. And the end. And the end. Uh-oh. Go ahead. And commanded him, saying, These words shalt thou declare, and these shalt thou hide. These words shalt thou declare, meaning make plain, like the laws of the Most High. Make that plain for people to understand. But these words shalt thou hide, like the parables in Deuteronomy 32, Numbers 24. Okay, uh, these things are somewhat difficult for the unlearned person to read and understand. From there, let's go to the Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 7 and verse 13. So the Lord showed Moses the secrets of the times, okay? He showed him many wondrous things. Now, Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 7 and verse 18. Watch what our forefather Solomon says. Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 7, verse 18. Mm -hmm. The beginning... Ending and mist of times. Start with the verse above it. Start at 17. Verse 17. For he hath given me certain knowledge. For the Lord gave Solomon certain knowledge. Of the things that are namely to know how the world was made. He gave Solomon the knowledge of certain things on how the world was made. Listen good. And the operation of the elements. And the operation of the elements. Here comes. The beginning. The beginning. Ending. The ending. And midst of the time. And the midst of the time. That word midst means middle of the times. So read that part again. For he hath given me certain knowledge of things that are namely to know how the world was made. Mm -hmm. And the operation of the elements. The beginning. The beginning. Ending. Ending. And midst of the times. And midst of the times. That's what we wanted to go to. The beginning. The end and the midst of the time. A lot of you, some of you know the beginning of time and some of you know the end of time. But very few of you know the midst of times, meaning the middle of time. And we're going to deal with that on this lesson. From there, let's go to Genesis. Let's go to the beginning of time. Okay? I'm going to take, uh, now this lesson has to be crammed in one hour. Okay? But I'm going to try and get through it all within, within an hour's time. Genesis 1, we want verse 20 to 23. Genesis chapter 1 verse 20. And God said, Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that had life and fowl that may fly above 
the earth in the open firmament of heaven. So the fowl is the birds. Go ahead. And God created whales. And God created whales. And every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly. Which the waters brought forth abundantly. So that's the fishes, the, the sea life. Go ahead. After their kind. After their kind. And every winged fowl after his kind. And every winged fowl after his kind. That's the birds. Come on. And God saw that it was good. Mm -hmm. Verse 22. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let the fowl multiply in the earth. Mm -hmm. And the evening and the morning were the fifth day. So the fifth day, what was made? You had birds created. You had fish sea life, okay, created. That was the fifth day. What verse you read at? Verse 23. Go ahead. Verse 24 now. No, no, no. Oh, we went down to 23. Now. I'm going to show you that on that day, that what day was that you just the fifth read? day. That was the fifth day of creation. What else? I'm gonna make it, I'm gonna show you in the apocrypha how the prophet Ezra. Remember, the Lord showed him many wondrous things. Ezra expounded on the creation on the fifth day. Watch this. Let's go to 2 Ezra chapter 6. We want verse 47 to 52. I need y'all to pay close attention to this. Okay? 2 Ezra chapter 6, verse 47. Mm -hmm. Upon the fifth day. What day? Upon the fifth day. So we're still dealing with the fifth day that Moses spoke of in Genesis 1, verse 20 to 23. Go ahead. Upon the fifth day thou saidest unto the seventh part, mm -hmm. where the waters were gathered, that it should bring forth living creatures. So now he's talking about the waters. Go ahead. Fowls and fishes. So what came forth? Fowls, meaning birds and fishes. Come on. And so it came to pass. Mm -hmm. For the dumb water and without life brought forth living things at the commandment of God. Now it says dumb water because the water of its own, of itself, has no intelligence, no uh, 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 life. Okay, that's why it's calling it the dumb water. Go ahead. That all people might praise thy wondrous works. That all people might praise the wondrous works of the Lord. Come on. Then didst thou ordain two living creatures. Now here's the part that Moses did not expound on. Okay, it was hidden. But Ezra, the Lord allowed Ezra to bring this part forth. Read it again. Then didst thou ordain two living creatures. On the same fifth day. The Most High ordained two living creatures. Go ahead. The one thou callest Enoch. One thou callest Enoch. Go ahead. And the other Leviathan. And the other thou callest Leviathan. Okay, now, in some Bibles, when you see that word Enoch there, E-N-O-C-H, there's a little letter next to it. It'll say, or behemoth. Okay, what verse you read down to? We're at 49. Go ahead. Verse 50. And did it separate the one from the other? So these two creatures, one called Enoch, which is behemoth, and the other one Leviathan, God separated them. Is that what it said? Yep. Come on. For the seventh part, namely where the water was gathered together, might not hold them both. So the waters could not hold Enoch, which is behemoth, and Leviathan together. Because these are two chief creatures. Go ahead. Unto Enoch thou gavest one part. Let's see what God gave Enoch, which is behemoth. Read that part again. Unto Enoch thou gavest one part, which was dried up the third day. What was dried up on the third day? The earth. The earth. The land was made on the third day. Go ahead. That he should dwell in the same part. He's going to explain where he's going to dwell. Wherein are a thousand hills. Wherein are a thousand hills. So what's that talking about? Dry land. Now remember, we're only going down to 52. Verse 52. Mm -hmm. But unto Leviathan. But unto Leviathan. Thou gavest the seventh part. Thou gavest the seventh part. Namely the moist. Namely the moist. And has kept him to be devoured of whom thou wilt and went. So what is Leviathan? What is Enoch, which is behemoth. Leviathan is what they, what you see on these movies, these dinosaurs, okay? All in the ocean realm, okay? Because there was a sister that, that called, or maybe her mother talked, I forgot who told us. She said, oh, I went to college and I decided to become an atheist. Why is that, sister? She said the dumbest statement, because the Bible does not talk about dinosaurs. If there are all these bones, why doesn't the Bible talk about these things? The Bible does talk about these things, but the Christian white man whom you love, whom you serve, took it out of the Bible and hid it in a book called the Apocrypha. Okay? So read that part again about the two creatures. Um, then didst thou ordain two living creatures, verse 49. The one thou calledest Enoch, and the other Leviathan, mm -hmm. and didst separate the one from the other. The seventh part, namely where the water was gathered together, might not hold them both. Unto Enoch thou gavest one part, which was dried up the third day, that he should dwell in the same part wherein are the thousand hills. Mm -hmm. But unto Leviathan thou gavest the seventh part, 
namely the moist, and has kept him to be devoured of whom thou wilt and when. And kept him to, that's why a lot of people go in the ocean and they just disappear. What happened? They got eaten by Leviathan. And remember, the Most High don't just make one creature. When he, did he make just one cow, a male and a female? Did he make just one bird, a male and a female? No, he made multitudes of birds. I need you to examine this. When he made birds, let's just deal with the birds. Did he just make an eagle, a male eagle and a mama eagle? And they made, all, they made pigeons. Out of those two birds, did he make pigeons? And all? No, he made multitudes of variations of those birds. When he made uh, the fish, he didn't just make a, a goldfish. You got the right. boy goldfish, one you species. got the girl. One spe he made multitudes of species of fish, multitudes of species of birds. Now we're dealing with Leviathan and Enoch, which is behemoth. He made multitudes of species. Now, just like man and woman, but that's for another lesson. Now, do me a favor, let's go to the book of Job. Job chapter 40, we're gonna deal with Enoch. Job chapter 40, we're going to read verse 15 through 24. Come on. Job chapter 40, verse 15. Behold now behemoth, which I made with thee. He eateth grass as an ox. So behemoth, this behemoth is the Enoch that you read in the book of Esdras. He said he eats grass like an ox. Go ahead. Lo, now his strength is in his loins. His strength is in his loins. Come on. And his force is in the navel of his belly. Come on. He moveth his tail like a cedar. He moveth his tail like a cedar. I want to pause there. Because when you get some Bibles, like in this one, and I, the one I got, it'll say possibly an elephant or a hippopotamus. That's what some Bibles in the center would say. Some of them. But I want you to read that verse. What verse is that? Verse 17. Listen good. He moveth his tail like a cedar. Anybody ever see a cedar? A cedar tree? C-E-D-A-R tree? It's one of the largest trees. So the Bible is saying that behemoth has a tail that's huge. He moves it like a tree. When it moves, it can knock everything down. Okay? A cedar tree isn't this wide. A cedar tree. You can't put your arm around a cedar tree. Understand that. So is this a hippopotamus? No, because a hippo, let me give me, yeah, watch this. Here's a hippopotamus tail. It'll look something like this. Here's an elephant tail. It'll look something like this. So that's not what the Bible's talking about. Understand that. Let's read that part again. Verse 17, he moveth his tail like a cedar. So behemoth moveth his tail like a cedar, come on. The sinews of his stones are wrapped together. The sinews, meaning the muscles of his stones, meaning his balls, is wrapped together like what? As sin as he moveth his tail like a cedar. Come on. The sinews of his stones are wrapped together. Come on. His bones are as strong pieces of brass. And it says his bones are as strong pieces of brass. Meaning this creature here is a powerful beast. Go ahead. He is the chief of the ways of God. This is what I want to get to also. He is the chief of the ways of God. Now, I need, I, I need y'all to bear with me a second. I'm going back to Ezra. I ain't got my glasses. You get it. Second Ezra 6. I, hold Job. Hold Job. Okay. I want the part where it said that it can't hold them both. Second Ezra 6, around 52 or something. Second Ezra chapter 6, verse 50. Okay. And did it separate the one from the other for the seventh part, namely wherein the waters were gathered together, might not hold them both. So the waters couldn't hold these two creatures together. Why? Let's go back to Job now. That verse you just read in Job 40. What verse was that? About the chief? Job chapter 40 verse 19. Listen. He is the chief of the ways of God. So behemoth which is Enoch is the chief of the ways of God. Meaning this is a powerful beast. Okay? That's why God said in Ezra the waters couldn't hold Leviathan and Enoch together. Those two creatures are powerful. They can't be together. They can't dwell together. One has to stay in the water. The other has to dwell on land. Come on. He is the chief of the ways of God. He that made him can make his sword to approach unto him. So he that made him, only God can approach behemoth, okay? So this ain't no regular beast you're going to tame and go, oh, Mr. Elephant, and put him in a circus. You ain't riding on his back, okay? He ain't eating out of your hand. Come on. White people always trying to tame something. Right. Come and on. You get trampled on TV. <laughs> Surely the mountains bring him forth food. Surely the mountains bring him forth food. Come Where on. Where all the beasts of the field play. Watch this. He lieth under the shady trees. 
in the covert of the reed and fence. Listen good. The shady trees cover him with their shadow. The willows of the brook compass him about. Behold, he drinketh up a river and hasteth not. He drinketh up a river. He drinketh up a river and hasteth not. Meaning he ain't in a rush when he drink. When he bring his head down to drink, it says he takes his time when he drink water. He don't rush. Go ahead. He trusted that he can draw up Jordan into his mouth. This creature so bad, so powerful, so big, so large. It said what? He taketh up Jordan into his mouth. He trusteth that he could drink up the whole Jordan River by himself. So this ain't an elephant. This ain't a hippopotamus. Go ahead. He taketh it with his eyes. He his, taketh it with his eyes. He looks upon it. Come on. His nose pierceth through the snare. His nose pierceth through the snares. What does that mean? You can't trap this creature like in Jurassic Park. Oh, we're going to trap the dinosaurs. You ain't trapping this. Okay, come on. Um, that's it on it. That was down to 50. Oh, we're at 41 now. Mm. Chapter 41. What's we're that? Go to 24. 40 to 24. Okay, 40 to 24. So now from there, watch this. Let's go from there. Let's go to Malachi. Okay? So now, that was the beginning of time. I wanted to go there just to show you what the Lord created on the fifth day. Okay? So along with birds and fish, amongst those fish in the waters, he created Leviathan and Enoch, which is behemoth. He had Enoch come upon land and dwell there. He said that creature is one of the, is the chiefest of his creations. He said he's so bad, so powerful, him and Leviathan cannot dwell together. That's why when you go into these museums, you see bones of these huge creatures, and you go, where, where are they? These creatures are not extinct. They're in parts of the earth that have not been discovered as yet. They got movies like Journey to the Center of the Earth, they got movies like Jurassic Park, where the white man knows what he's discovering. He sees these bones, he's trying to figure it out, and he goes, maybe when they evolve, there's no evolution. Believe that. The Most High is telling you what he did in the beginning. Okay. And let me point out, even with the ocean, they have parts down there that mankind doesn't have any vehicles that can reach down there without it being destroyed. Exactly. They can make it to the moon, but they can't make it to the bottom of the sea. They don't have any equipment that can make it down there. Exactly. So now we read about the fifth day just to show you that on the fifth day, what the Lord created in the beginning of time that's not discussed in Sunday school or any of your churches. Now, from there, let's go to Malachi chapter 1. We're going to read verse 1 through 4, and I need you to read it slow. Malachi chapter 1. Verse 1. Come on. The burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. I have loved you, saith the Lord. Yet ye say, wherein hast thou loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother? So God responds, was not Esau Jacob's brother? Come on. Saith the Lord, yet I love Jacob. So God says, yet I love Jacob. Go ahead. And I hated Esau. And he what? And I hated Esau. Who is Esau? Some of you that have been following and studying, I pray that you got your Bibles, your pens, and your papers. Okay, take notes because what we're showing you, you're not going to learn in your church, your phony church. You ain't going to learn it. So God says, was not Jacob Esau's brother? Who is Esau? The entire white race. And God said, what about Esau? And I hated Esau. And I hated Esau. Some of you trying to marry them and make excuses for marrying them. The Bible says God hates Esau. Watch this. Come on. And laid his mountains and his heritage waste so the dragons. God laid Esau's mountains and his heritage waste, meaning he destroyed them. Not destroyed them, but destroyed their heritage. He made them uh, base, that's what he's talking about. Read it again. And laid his mountains and his heritage waste Going into the his dragons. heritage, going into his heritage, how he made them a base people. When was this? Was this in the beginning, during the time of Jacob and Esau? No, hold on, we're coming right back here. Hold on. When did God make his heritage waste for the dragons and all that? Let's go to uh, Genesis 36. I'm going to show you that what we're reading about in Malachi is prophetic for the middle of times and not the beginning. Now, let's see. Genesis chapter 36. We want verse 6, 7, and then we're going to jump to verse 15 just to get to the point. Genesis chapter 36, verse 6. Mm -hmm. And Esau took his wives. Read that and again. His, and Esau took his wives and his sons and his daughters, and all the persons of his house, and his cattle, and all his beasts, and all his substance, which he had got in the land of Canaan, mm. and went into the country from the face of his brother Jacob. For their riches were more 
than that they might dwell together. Wait, what, what? For their riches were more than that they might dwell together. What verse is that? Verse 7. So now you see it says their riches. Esau was rich in the beginning. Esau and Jacob were rich. Understand that. So what we're reading about in Malachi, where it said he laid his heritage and all that waste, that ain't talking about at this time. I'm going to show you some more proof. What verse is that? That was 7. You finished 7? Yeah. Jump to 15. Verse 15. These were dukes of the sons of Esau, the son of Eliphaz, the firstborn son of Esau, Duke Taman, Duke Omar, Duke Zepho, Duke Kenaz. Verse 16. So now, they were called, they had the noble titles of dukes. Who is that talking about Esau? So in the beginning with Jacob and Esau, yes, Esau was rich. His family had nobles amongst them. They were the dukes, okay? Let's go back to Malachi now. I just wanted to go in there to show you that what Malachi is talking about is not during the beginning, okay, of time. Uh, Malachi chapter 1, what verse you Verse 3. Read verse 2 again. Verse 2. Mm -hmm. I have loved thee, saith the Lord. Yet ye say, wherein hast thou loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord? Yet I loved Jacob, and I hated Esau, Watch this. and laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. So that wasn't during the time of Jacob and Esau. Read on. Whereas Edom said... Now I need y'all to listen close to this. This part right here. Read that part again. Whereas Edom said... Whereas Edom saith. Edom means what? Red. Red people. Who is the red people? The so-called white man. They're called white, but they're not really white. They are really red. The blood, the red blood shows through their skin. That's why down south, many southern places, we call them rednecks. It's not just their necks that get red. They get red from the top of their head to the soles of their feet. Read it again. Where does Edom say it? Where does Edom say it? We are impoverished. We are impoverished. So that's not during the time of Genesis. Because in Genesis, what did it say? They were what? That they were dukes and they were so rich that they couldn't even dwell together, right. Jacob and Esau. So this ain't talking about in the book of Genesis. What is Malachi talking about? Malachi is talking about the middle of time, the middle ages. Read it again. Whereas Edom said, we are impoverished, but we will return and build the desolate places. Thus saith the Lord of hosts. Stop. We are impoverished. But we will what? Return and build the desolate places. Read it again. We are impoverished, but we will return and build the desolate places. We are impoverished. I want to deal with that right there. Now remember, when we get back to this, we're going to start off there. East Edom says we are impoverished, meaning they're, they're low. Their heritage was low. They were poor, dirt, bums, nasty. When was this talking about? The middle of time, the middle of ages. I'm going to show you more proof. Go to the book of Job. Job chapter 30, we're going to read verse 1 through 10. Listen good, because a lot of you sit home and you wondered about the dinosaurs. We just proved to you that the dinosaurs are mentioned in the Bible. Then some of you go, what about the cavemen? Oh, you want to know about the cavemen? We're going to show you about the cavemen. God is going to reveal to you who the true cavemen are. Job chapter 30, verse 1. We're going to read 1 through 10. Job chapter 30, verse 1. Come on. But now they that are younger than I have me in derision. Now they that are younger than I have me in derision. Job is speaking metaphorically, okay? Who is younger than I, okay? Is talking about the so-called white man, the nation of Edom. And as we read down, it's going to become crystal clear to you. Go ahead. But now they that are younger than I... Because we're the heirs. We're the top, top nation on the earth, okay? Although it don't look like it, God said the Israelites, the sons and daughters of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob... Okay, the, the children of the Hebrews, that's us. We're the chosen, we're the elect. Read it again. But now they that are younger than I. Meaning they ain't as great as we are. Have me in derision. Have me in derision, go ahead. Whose fathers I would have disdained to have set with the dogs of my flock. Our forefather Job said, I wouldn't have let that race, that group of people, set with the dogs of my flock. Come on. Yea, where to might the strength of their hands profit me? How could the strength of their hands profit me? Come on. In whom old age was perished. In whom old age was perished. Come on. For want and famine they were solitary. For want? I want you to listen good to that part here. For want, meaning lack, and famine, they were solitary, meaning isolated, okay? What is that linking with? Remember we read in Malachi, where Edom does saith Edom, we are impoverished. Read that verse again. For want and famine, they were solitary. They were solitary, come on. Fleeing into the wilderness. Fleeing into the wilderness. In former times. In former times. What times is he talking about? The middle ages, not the beginning. 
beginning with Genesis because in Genesis, Edom was rich. This is talking about the middle of time, what y'all call the middle ages in your school systems. Come on. Fleeing into the wilderness in former time, desolate and waste. Desolate and waste. Who cut up mallows by the bushes. Who cut up mallows by the bushes. And juniper root for and, their meat. And juniper root for their meat. This is talking about Esau when he dwelt in the caves. Come on, it's going to say that. They were driven forth from among men. Read that again. They were driven forth from among men. They was driven forth from among men. The white man was driven forth from among men. When, what time period is this? The Middle Ages, okay? That's when they were the cavemen, okay? They were the Neanderthals. They were the Cro-Magnon man. Watch, come on. They were driven forth from among men. Come on. They cried after them as after a thief. We chased after them like after, like they stole something. We chased after them like they stole something. Okay, read it again. They were driven forth from among men. They cried after them as after a thief. Come on. To dwell in the cliffs of the valleys in caves of the earth. Wait, 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 wait. In case you didn't know that this is talking about the white man, Edom. Hold that. Go to Obadiah. Let's get that quick. I'm giving you precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little and there a little. It talked about this group of people which chased up into the caves of the rocks. Who is this talking about? Let's go to the book of Obadiah, where Obadiah prophesied about the Edomites, about the descendants of Esau. Obadiah verse 1. Obadiah chapter 1. Obadiah verse 1. The vision of Obadiah thus saith the Lord God concerning Edom. We have heard a rumor from the Lord. An ambassador is sent among the heathen. Arise ye, and let us rise up against her in battle. Come on. Behold, I have made thee small among the heathen. So Edom is made small amongst the nations. Come on. Thou art greatly despised. And the white race is greatly despised. Many nations, they call him the great Satan. Go ahead. The pride of thine heart hath deceived thee. But Esau has a lot of pride. Go ahead. Thou that dwellest in the clefts of the rock. Thou that dwellest in the clefts of the rock. Thou that dwellest in the clefts of the rock. Thou that dwellest in the clefts of the rock. We don't read on. Whose habitation is high. That's why they like skyscrapers. Come on. That saith in his heart, who shall bring me down to the ground? Why, why would they be able to say that? Because now Esau has missile capabilities. They have nuclear armaments. They have a Star Wars system, okay? Read. Will thou exalt thyself as the eagle? This, I'm, re I'm only reading down to prove to you that this is talking about the white man. Though thou exalt thyself as the eagle, what is the symbol of America? The eagle. What is the symbol of the white man when he was set up as the Greeks? The eagle. When he was Rome? The eagle. When he was Spain? The eagle. Come on. Though thou exalt thyself as the eagle, and though thou set thy nest amongst the stars. Though thou set thy nest among the stars, who's doing space travel, whose symbol is the eagle? The white man under the United States of America. Was that it? Thence will I bring thee down, saith the Lord. Go back to the cave. Say, no, stay right there. The proud of thine heart hath deceived thee, thou that dwellest in the clefts of the rock. Stop. When you read in Genesis, uh, when you read in Genesis, where did Esau originally dwell? In Mount Seir, okay? Which was a range of rocks that was shaped like hair. Because that's what the word Seir means. It means hair. But during the Middle Ages, I'm going to say it again. During the Middle Ages, where did they dwell? They dwelt in the clefts of the rocks in Georgia, Russia. Why are they called Caucasian? Where does the word Caucasian derive from? It comes from the Caucasus Mountains of Georgia, Russia. That's why they say, I'm American, Caucasian. I'm Italian, Caucasian. I'm Spanish, Caucasian. I'm German, Caucasian. Okay? I'm Polish, Caucasian. Read that part again. Thou that dwellest in the clefts of the rock. Now stop there. Go back to Job now. Job 30, and I want that part about the rocks again. You see it? Call it verse of chapter 30, verse 5. Listen good. They were driven forth from among men. They cried after them as after a thief to dwell in the cliffs of valleys in caves of the earth and in the rocks. Read that again. To dwell in the cliffs of valleys in caves of the earth and in the rocks. Do you hear where they used to dwell? So in case you didn't know who Job chapter 30 is talking about, I gave you the proper precept, Obadiah tells you they would dwell in the caves, in the clefts of the rock. Job says this group of people here, 
who I wouldn't let sit with the dogs of my flock. We chase after them like after a thief. We chase them to the caves, to the cops of the rocks. When did that happen? Because it wasn't during the time of Genesis. Because in the book of Genesis, they were rich. Okay? But in Job, this is prophetic. That goes back to the book of Malachi. When Edom says we are impoverished. When were they impoverished? Right here in Job 30. Let's read that again. They were driven forth from among men. Mm -hmm. They cried after them as after a thief. Come on. To dwell in the cliffs of the valleys, in caves of the earth, and in the rock. So what does the word... That's why they're called Caucasian. It comes from the rocks of Georgia, Russia. The Caucasus Mountains. Hold that. Give me... Hold I need you to hold that. Give me the book, The 13th Child. Give me that book. I just need you to... We're going right back there in jokes. I don't, I don't want you to lose your okay. place. Okay. Let me, let me show the book here. I See, y'all need to get this book called The Thirteenth Tribe, okay? It's written by a so-called white man, a so-called Jewish scholar named, uh, where's his name? Arthur Kosler, okay? He did research on his heritage as being a Jew. What page we gonna go to? Page 16, 16 and 17. Now, I got, you can go on Amazon and order an original copy, the old ones. Don't, the new ones, they edited it. They took a lot of things out. And, and you can Google it also. You can read it online. If you go to Google and type this in, you can read it. They have the pages up right there. So what page are we at? Page 16? Page 16. Now, just read the, the underline. Uh, just read everything here, 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 and here. Read it quick. Page 16. Of a migration of the Khazar tribes and communities in those regions of Eastern Europe. Eastern Europe, talking about Georgia, Russia. Go mainly ahead. Russia and Poland. See where it says Russia? Because that's where the Caucasus Mountains are. Go ahead. We're at the dawn of modern age. Come on. The greatest concentration of the Jews were found. Mm -hmm. This has led several historians to conjecture that a substantial part and perhaps the majority of Eastern Jews and hence of world jewelry might be of Khazar and not of Semitic origin. Meaning they're not the real Jews. That's what this guy, Arthur Kosler, discovered. He realized he was not the true Jew. He was not of uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Go. Next highlighted part. Thus, in 1973 edition of the Encyclopedia Judica, the article Khazar is signed by Dunlop, but there is a separate section dealing with the Khazar Jews after the fall of the kingdom. The Khazar Jews dwell where in the Caucasus Mountains? Come on. Signed by the editors and written with obvious intent to avoid upsetting believers in the dogma of the chosen race. Right, because they raised those white, these white people up today to believe they're the chosen race. They had to edit the encyclopedia so they wouldn't get offended. Go ahead. Dump down here. A new approach, both to the problem of the relations between the Khazar Jews and other Jewish communities, and to the question of how far we can go in regarding this Khazar Jewry as the nucleus of the large Jewish settlement in Eastern Europe, the descendants of this settlement, those who stayed were they those of who emigrated to the United States and to other countries, and those who went to Israel constitute now the large majority of the world Jewry. See that? So what are they? Khazar Jews, meaning Caucasians. Now watch this, page 17. It's going to say exactly what I'm saying. Page 17. This was written before the full extent of the Holocaust was known. So this was written before the full extent of the Holocaust was known. Go ahead. But that does not alter the fact that the large majority of surviving Jews in the world of Eastern Europe, and thus perhaps mainly of Khazar origin, if so, this would mean that their ancestors came not from the Jordan, but from the Volga. Not for wait, wait, where's the Volga? The Volga is a river that's in the Georgia, Russia. He says they didn't come from the Jordan, but from the Volga over there. Go ahead. If so, this would mean that their ancestors came not from the Jordan, but from the Volga, and not from Canaan. Not from Canaan, the true land of Israel. But from the Caucasus. But from the Caucasus. What's that talking about? The Caucasus Mountains of Georgia, Russia. Who wrote this? A so-called white man, Arthur Kosler. He said if the white man is a Jew, then it would have to be an additional tribe added. Okay? What other page are we going to on this book? Um, one more sentence. Okay. It says the story of the Khazar Empire, as it slowly emerges from the past, begins to look like the most cruel hoax which history has ever perpetrated. <laughs> 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 
Jesus is saying? Now, what other, what other page uh, do I have down there? Um, 39. Page 39. Go to page 39. Okay. Now, don't get angry at us because we didn't write this. The white scholars put this together. Call it and read it. Page 39. Go ahead. The goods do not wash themselves. The goods. Now, the goods is a group of white people who dwelt in the Caucasus Mountains of Georgia, Russia. The goods. Listen good. The goods do not wash themselves after defecating or urinating, nor do they bathe after seminal pollution. Or <clears throat> on other occasions, they refuse to have anything to do with water, particularly in winter. When the goods commander in chief took off his luxurious coat of brocade to don a new coat the mission had brought him, they saw that his underclothes were fraying apart from dirt. Mm. For it is their custom never to take off the garment they wear close to their body. So they would leave their underwear on until it disintegrates, go ahead. Until it disintegrates. So these people said they wouldn't have anything to do with what, have danger for all on the shoulders, just danger for everybody, they're nasty, go ahead. Another Turkish tribe, the Bashkirs, shave their beards and eat their lights. And what? And eat their lights. Mm. They search the folds of their undergarments and crack the lice with their teeth. They search the folds of their undergarments, their drawers, and crack the lice with their teeth. Go ahead. When Ibn Fadlon watched a Bakshire do this, the latter remarked to him, they're delicious. That guy said it's delicious now. Let's go right back to the Bible. See, you've been thinking that the Bible is a fairy tale. You see movies about cavemen. Get that movie Quest for Fire. The only lie in that movie is they got the black, the ignorant black woman running around with them, ooh, 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 but they're giving you their history during the Middle Ages. They wasn't cavemen in the beginning. They were cavemen during the Middle Ages. Call that verse again. Verse 5. They were driven, Job chapter 30, verse 5. Mm -hmm. They were driven forth from among men. They cried after them as after a thief to dwell in the cliffs of the valleys and caves of the earth and in the rocks. Mm -hmm. Among the bushes they braid. In the bushes they braid, go ahead. Under the nettles they were gathered together. Under the nettles they were looking for food and all kind of stuff, cracking the lights from the underwear they draws. They were children of fools. They were what? Children of fools. Go ahead. They were children of basement. What does that mean, children of basement? Like the basement. You can't get no lower. That's the bottom of society. Go ahead. They were viler than the earth. They were what? They were viler than the earth. That's your Neanderthal. That's your Cro-Magnon man, okay? You wasn't Cro-Magnon man. You wasn't Neanderthal man. You are the Israelites, okay? This is their history. The Bible is giving you the white man's history. Come on. And now am I their song. Mm -hmm. Yea, I am their byword. See what Job is saying? Now am I their song. Now I am their byword. So what is he prophetically saying? That in history, once the Israelites went into captivity under who? Edom, we will become a by Hold that. Get that in Deuteronomy 28 and verse 37, I believe it is. Come on. Deuteronomy chapter 28. Verse 37. Verse 37. Mm. And thou shalt become an astonishment. This is when the Israelites would go into slavery, especially under the white man. Go ahead. And thou shalt become an astonishment, a proverb, and a byword among all nations whether the Lord shall lead thee. Let's go back to Job now. What he says in the spirit. Job chapter 30 verse 9. And now am I their song. Yea, I am their byword. You see, you see the correlation? You see the precepts? Okay? Because this whole thing of Job, although Job was real, it, his whole life was a, a metaphor for the whole nation of Israel. Read. They abhor me. They abhor me, meaning hate me. They abhor me. They flee far from me. Now, when was this? See, it starts off saying that they were violent in the earth, right? It said Job would not have let the dogs sit with them. But something happened in history. That the people that was the vilest, the people that was on the bottom, became on top. Job says, now I'm their song. Now I'm their byword. It said they abhor me. They hate me. What is the change? What happened historically? Well, did you finish down the text? They flee far from me. Now these vile people, they run from us now. And spare not to spit in my face. And spare not to spit in my face. So what happened? Let's go back to Malachi. Malachi chapter 1. Again, wait, whereas Edom saith, call a, call a chapter and verse. Malachi chapter 1, verse 4. Listen good. Whereas Edom saith, we are impoverished. Now, when were they impoverished? During the Middle Ages. I guess gave you biblical proof. 
During the Middle Ages, that they, what it means when it says they were impoverished. We went to Job chapter 30, where God, through the prophet Job, spoke about their history. We went to Markproof. We went to the 13th tribe, where Arthur Kosler, a so-called white scholar, explained his ancestry, his history during the Middle Ages in the Caucasus Mountains. They were viler than the earth. They ate lice. They would wear underwear to disintegrate it off their bodies. Read it again. Whereas Edom say it, we are impoverished. But we will return and build the desolate places. But we will return and build the desolate places. But we will return and build the desolate places. Return. When did they return? What does the word renaissance mean, brothers and sisters? Look it up. Renaissance means rebirth. Rebirth of what? Because you learn about it in your school system. No, oh, this is the renaissance era. Huh? Rebirth of what? Rebirth of the white man in power and authority in the earth. That's what it means when it says, we will return. So when were they impoverished? During the Middle Ages. I'm going to give you another term for the Middle Ages. It's called the Dark Ages. Why was it called the Dark Ages? Because dark-skinned people ruled. What people? The Israelites ruled. I'm going to show you more proof on that. Hold that. Bear with me a second. Bear with me. Get me that. Get me uh, uh, from Superman to man. I mean, uh, that right there. Nature knows no color line. Get the page in the book. Nature me, knows no color line. Yeah, let me show the, show the cover of the book. This is by J.A. Rogers, okay, who was a black scholar during the early 1900s. Okay, so you know what pages we're going to go to? Page 76 first. Okay, let's go to page 76 first. I'm going to show you that during the Middle Ages, okay, when, the, when we drove the white man up to the Caucasus Mountains, okay, we ran after them as after a thief. We chased them like they stole something, okay? They were viler than the earth. So during the Middle Ages, it was also called the Dark Ages. So we're on page 76. Show what J.A. Rogers discovered when he went out through Europe, okay? When J.A. Rogers went through Europe, he discovered black men on coats of arms, black men and women. Up here, who is this? Henry VIII. It tells you down here at the bottom, okay? You got Sir Chancellor Moore. You got Queen Elizabeth. Notice all these black men and black women on these coats of arms, okay? So now, let's get another page. Get another page. What page, page 78. Show them page 78. Negroes in coats of arms Read of noble families. English Morrison means son of the Moors. The word Moor means black. Okay. Can you see that? All right. Now, let's go to the next page. I'm still showing you what occurred during the Middle Ages, during the Dark Ages. Page 83. 83. Read the top and the bottom. Negroes in coats of arms of noble families. French, Dutch, and Belgian families with names of Negro. So now I want you to see that, okay? These are French and Dutch families. J. A. Rogers, they, when he, this is the, like 1915, 1917, he went over there and saw all this stuff, sketched it down, what he discovered. Because, brothers and sisters, your history has been hidden from you. Let's go to the next page. What's the next page we're going to? Page 84. 84. Read the top and the bottom. Negroes in coats of arms of noble families. Names of these families except three denote Negro ancestry. And read the bottom of the next page. We'll show it together. French, Italian, Spanish, Polish family. French, Italian, Spanish, Polish family. Let's say Polish here. So we were, during, we were originally living all over there, ruling during the dark ages, brothers and sisters. Okay? This is what I need you all to understand. Okay, so when we were the noble families, where was the white man? They were in the Caucasus Mountains of Georgia, Russia, eating juniper roots, eating mallows, braying under the nettles. Okay, okay, so now you see all this proof here. Okay, is there another page we're going to? Page 85, 86. 86. Okay, okay, this says Negroes in coats of arms of noble families. German families with names of Negro origin. German families with names of Negro origins. You see this? You see what they discovered? What J.A. Rogers, a black historian, discovered? Okay? You're not going to learn this in school, brothers and sisters. You're not going to learn this in Sunday school either or your churches. Okay? So now, from there, let's go to this book. I'm going to show you. 
this book called The Russian Icons by a white man named Father Vladimir Ivanov. Here's a, an icon of St. George the Dragon Slayer. What color is St. George? He's a black man riding a horse, okay? Now, you might ask yourself, how come they're portrayed uh, Caucasian in schools? I'm going to go to the back of the book where actual photographs, these Greek Orthodox bastards are hired by the Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Church, to whitewash all the black art. You see what he's doing here with the paintbrush? Here's a black image of Christ back here. Here's another black image, black. But here in the foreground, he's Caucasian, okay? Up here is a picture of Mary and Christ, black, okay? Here on the side, you have black Christ, black Mary. Then you got Caesar Borgia right there, okay? They're hired to destroy the black art. Let's show you some more of during the Dark Ages. Here's a book called the Varane, okay? In Romania, right? Hold that side right there. Here's a picture of one of the churches in Romania. If you look closely, you see images of black people as kings and priests all on the church, church painting, okay? Now I'm going to show you a painting of the judgment. Hold that side. Here's a picture of the hand of God. What color is the hand of God? Black. Then look right here. You got these two, this pale man here. Judgment. This is the white man getting judged by God. What color is the angel here? Black. Okay. Here's King David when he was old. Playing on a lyre. Okay. Black. Okay. Here's the prophets and the apostles. What color are they? Black. So-called black. Different shades of brown. When was this painted? During the dark ages when dark men, dark-skinned Israelites were ruling throughout all of Europe. Okay? Where was the white man? In caves. Okay? Was that it? So now, going back to Malachi now. Back to the book of Malachi chapter 1 and verse 4 again. Malachi chapter 1 verse 4. Mm-hmm. Whereas Edom said, we are impoverished. We are impoverished. When was Edom impoverished? During the Middle Ages, okay? When we chased them like they stole something. We chased them to the caves of the rocks of Georgia, Russia, okay? That's when they became the Neanderthals. That's when they became Cro-Magnon man. And a lot of you unlearned black men, black women talking about their hunks. They're the hunks of the earth. You don't give a white man a Gillette razor. You can, you can only imagine how they look. They're women too. They get all the hair on the forehead and the sides of the face. You ever see them with the little hair things? Crazy. And y'all in love with them. Read that again. Whereas Edom said, we are impoverished, but we will return and build the desolate places. When did they return and build the desolate places? During the Renaissance. The word Renaissance means rebirth. Rebirth of what? Rebirth of Edom in rulership in the earth. Was that it? Thus saith the Lord of hosts, they shall build, but I will throw down. Mm -hmm. See what the prophecy says? God says, you shall build. And you've built from the Renaissance era all the way up to right now today. But God says what? They shall build, but I will throw down. God's going to throw down. And they shall call them the border of wickedness. What will, he, what will we call Esau the white man? And they shall call them the border of wickedness. The border of wickedness. And the people against whom the Lord hath indignation forever. And the people against whom the Lord has indignation, meaning righteous hatred forever. That's what the Bible says. You ain't learn this in Sunday school. You ain't learn this in church, okay? From there. So what happened? How'd they get so much power? Give me that in Luke. Luke 4. Where Satan took Christ on the mountain. Okay? Wait, 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 wait. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You get that. I'm, I, 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 go ahead. Go ahead. Luke chapter 4, verse 6. Mm -hmm. And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them. For that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will give it, if thou therefore will worship me, all shall be thine. See what Satan said to Christ? If you worship me, all shall be thine. Didn't it say he showed them all the kingdoms of the earth? Let's go up a little bit more. Go ahead. Okay. And the devil taking him up, this is the fifth verse, into the high mountain, showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me. 
and to whomsoever I will give it. If thou therefore will worship me, all shall be thine. So Satan showed Christ all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. He said, all shall be yours if you worship me. I just wanted to show you that to show you how Satan operates. Get Revelation now. 13, verse 1 and 2. Let's Revelation chapter 13, verse 1. Listen good. And I stood upon the sound of the sea. Now my question to you is, how did the white man return during the Renaissance and conquer everybody? Here's the answer. And I stood upon the sign of the sea, and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. Who is this beast with seven heads and ten horns? Get to chapter 12 and the description of the beast. Chapter 12, verse 3. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon. A great red dragon. Why is it red? Because it symbolizes one race of people. What race of people in the Bible are described as red? That's right, Edom, the so-called white man. Back to chapter 13, where you was at. 13 verse 1. Come on. And I stood upon the side of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. The seven heads meaning there's seven major empires. Go ahead. And the ten horns means the European Union. Go ahead. And upon his horns ten crowns. Come on. And upon his heads the name of blasphemy. Come on. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard. Mm -hmm. And his feet was like unto a, of a bear. Go ahead. And his mouth as the mouth of a lion. Meaning he spoke great blasphemies. Come on. And the dragon gave him his power. That's the part I wanted right there. See, I'm rushing through it because I'm short for time. But the part for this red dragon with seven heads and ten horns. Who gave him their power? And the dragon gave him his power. Meaning Satan gave them their power. Remember, that's where we went to Luke. What did Satan say to Christ? It said he showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And he said to Christ, if you bow down and worship me, all this shall be yours. For it is given unto me to deliver to whomsoever I will. So now in Revelation, it tells you about the last empire on earth with seven great heads and ten horns. It said the dragon gave them their power. That's how they got nuclear armaments. That's how they got the Star Wars program. That's how come they're ruling the planet Earth. Okay? From there, Job chapter 9. You got One something? Part. Go ahead. And the dragon I gave him his at. power. This is still Revelation 13 verse 2. Okay. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat. Oh, that part. And his seat. And great authority. And great authority. Authority. That's why I'm, I'm sorry. I forgot that. That's very important. The dragon gave them their power, their seat, and great authority. So you might have asked, how could the white man come out of the caves of Georgia, Russia? They were the Cro Magnon mans. They were the Neanderthals. And they conquered and ruled everybody. Satan. Can you say Satan? They bowed down and worshiped the devil. And the dragon gave them their power. Job chapter 9 and verse. 24. I need that book to point the fingers. Okay. Job 9 verse 24. Listen good. The earth is given into the hand of the wicked. See that? The earth is given into the hand of the wicked. What did Malachi chapter 1 verse 4 say about Edom? They shall call them the border of wickedness. Read it again. The earth is given into the hand of the wicked. The earth is given into the hand of the wicked. Come on. He covereth the faces of the judges thereof. He covereth the faces of the judges thereof. Who are the judges? The judges are the Israelites, the 12 tribes of Israel. How does the wicked cover our faces? They went throughout all Europe. They going throughout the world and painting our images as white. I'm going to show you another example. Here's a book called Spain. A History in Art. Okay? Hold this. Now, right here, you might just see two white women, right? Is that what you see? But let's look at their fingers. What do you notice about their fingers? What, did they dip them in chocolate? No. These, so, these what you think are white women, were really, at one time, black women, okay? Look at the stains on their neck, okay? See the brown color on their neck coming through the paint? These were black women that they covered their faces to make them look and appear like Caucasians. Okay, that's how they cover the faces of the judges. Understand that. Okay, what does this say? Early Spanish Christians assisted by angels. Let's look at the angels here. Okay, all that. Look at their hands. Because you might go, oh, these white people. Look at their hands, their fingertips. Look. These are black people. All right? Look, look at the color. 
These were at one time black men, but they've been touched, dabbled with. Whitewashed. Whitewashed. Right. Look at the hair. Look at the kinky hair on them. Okay? <laughs> Do y'all see this? All these books are in your libraries. Okay? Like I said, black they people. They removed them. Right. It's, it's hard to get them now. Okay? So, brothers, sisters, we pray. Now, I wasn't able to get to the, to the end. Okay? But, brothers, sisters, you just stay tuned, okay? Give me 2 Ezra 6 and 9 in Apocrypha. 2 Ezra 6, verse 9. Because the disciples asked Christ, when is the end of the world going to come? 2 Ezra chapter 6, verse 9. For Esau is the end of the world. Esau is the end of the world. And Jacob is the beginning of it that follows. And Jacob is the beginning of it that follows. Now, from there, go to 1 Maccabees chapter 3, I think it's verse 48. Yeah. Okay. I think it's 1 Maccabees chapter 3 and verse 48. 1 Maccabees 3 verse 48. And laid open the book of the law. The book of the law is the Bible. Wherein the heathen had sought to paint the likeness of their images. Wherein the heathen, meaning the white man, because that's who the heathen is here. They were the Greeks. Had sought to what? To paint the likeness of their images. The white man painted their images throughout our records, throughout our holy Bible. And not only in this book, they painted throughout our, our temples, our synagogues that we had set up. They did. There's much evil that they have done when they've made us a base people. That's why Job said, now I'm their song. Now they, they spitting in my face. Okay? Now they're calling us niggas and jigaboos and coons and all that. But meanwhile, we're the noble families of the earth, okay? We're God's chosen people. Deuteronomy 7, verse 6 and 7. We are the noble kings and priests of the earth. And guess what? We are returning now in the power of the Most High. Deuteronomy 7, verse 6. For thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God has chosen thee to be a special people unto himself above all people really? that are upon the face we, of the we earth. We probably get you ran through that. For thou art in holy people unto the Lord thy God. Mm -hmm. The Lord thy God has chosen thee. The Lord thy God has chosen thee, black man, black woman, Latin man, Latin woman, to be a special people believe unto it or not, himself. Believe it or not, you are a special people. You don't believe it, but you are. Go ahead. Above all people that are upon the face of the earth. The Bible said above, above, above all people. That are upon the face of the earth. Why don't you teach your young sons and daughters that? If you taught them that, they wouldn't be raping and robbing each other. If you taught them that, they wouldn't be pimps and hoes. Okay? They wouldn't be in the prison houses. If you taught them that. But stay tuned. Please, stay tuned. Bear with us. Write us. Call us, brothers and sisters. We are here for you. We're servants of the Lord. Our job is to serve you in bringing you the truth of the Most High God. Brothers, sisters, we can't do this alone without you. We need your financial support. We need you to send in your donation, your free will offerings. Okay, visit us at www.israelunite.org and visit us on YouTube at www.youtube.com slash Nathaniel. And with that, we give all praise to the Most High and His Son, Jesus the Christ, and we say Shalom. Shalom, Israel.